Please be seated. The court is now in session. Today, the chamber is hearing the response from the co-prosecutors in relation to the key documents presented by Q. Sumpon on the role of the accused. Jesse Wong, the greffier, please report the attendance and other of the parties and other individuals to today's proceeding. Refier. Mr. President, for today's proceedings, all parties to this case are present. Except Mr. Victor Cope, the defense, co defense for Nguyen Chia, advised that uh, he is absent this afternoon for health reasons. Mr. Nguyen Chia is present in the holding cell downstairs. He has waived his rights to be present in the courtroom. The waiver has been delivered to the greffier. Thank you, Mr. President. President, thank you, uh, GSU Huang. The chamber now decides the, on the request by Nguyen Chia. The chamber has received a waiver from Nguyen Chia dated 5th of January 2017, which states that due to his health, headache, back pain, he cannot sit or concentrate for long. And in order to effectively participate in future hearings, he requests to waive his right to be present at the 5th of January 2017 hearing. Having seen the medical report of Nguyen Chia by the duty doctor for the accused at the ECCC dated 5th of January 2017, which notes that Nguyen Chia has a constant lower back pain when he sits and feels dizzy when he sits for long and recommends that the chamber shall grant him a request so that he can follow the proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs. Based on the above information and pursuant to Rule 81.5 of the ECC internal rules, the chamber grants Nguyen Chia his request to follow today's proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs via an audio-visual means. The AV unit personnel are instructed to link the proceedings to the room downstairs so that Nguyen Chia can follow. That applies for the whole day. Now the chamber hands over the floor to the co-prosecutors to respond to the key documents presented by the defense team for accusing point yesterday. You may now proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors Counsel. Yesterday, counsel for Hussam Pan spent much of her time talking about the policies of the leadership of the CPK and defending those policies. We think it makes a lot of sense for Hussam Pan's counsel to do that because it was Hussam Pan who facilitated those policies and who promoted those policies in his speeches, in his training of cadre. One seeming uh, misunderstanding defense counsel seems to have is they argue that the regime didn't intend that all of those who starved, starved, that the regime wanted to build the economy and uh, hope to increase rice production. It has never been the prosecution case that all of those who starved, that that was the conscious objective of the leadership of the Khmer Rouge. Our case, our position is that they were simply indifferent to the suffering of individuals and of the people. That they treated people like they would farm animals. They exercised the powers of ownership. A farmer doesn't want his oxen to die, but doesn't care about his oxen's death the same as his children. That is the same as the policies of the CPK which put the survival of the regime leadership and their reputation, their belief that they were at the forefront of revolutionary movements in the world far ahead of the interests of the people of Cambodia. 
and led to the suffering, the starvation, and the enslavement of the population. Council uh, reiterated a point the defense has often tried to make, saying, well, the center didn't have control because the zone secretaries were like warlords, quoting Philip Short. But if you read Philip Short in his entirety, his book, and particularly his testimony in case 2-1, he doesn't say that the center did not control the policies. He says, in fact, at page in uh, the ERN in English is 00396491, in French 00639820, and there's no Khmer, that the zone secretaries, latter-day mandarins, in the role of the provincial warlords, loyal to the CPK center. So while he talked about them having considerable latitude in their own work, as many regional or commands governors of different provinces do, he indicated clearly and consistently in his book and in his testimony that these zone leaders followed the leadership of the center. And in fact, the constitution or the statute of the CPK makes it absolutely clear what the chain of command is. In Article 27, it talks about the role of the army. And I'll actually ask my colleague to read it because I think there's a typo and the English is not grammatically, does not, does not make sense. So I think it's best to read the original of Article 27 in Khmer. <laughs> President, please hold on. You may not proceed. Uh, we Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Co-Prosecutor. I would like to know the reference of the document that the Co-Prosecutor is referring to is, is it in Philip Short's work in the ERN that he gave us or it is in another document? Because I believe that in the context of responses there was not any use of a new document and in any case the responses are not supposed to be presenting new documents because the co-prosecution gave up his right to present documents on, in this context. So I would like to know what the uh, direct document reference is for the citation to come. Thank you. My colleague was going to give that. That's E3 slash 214. I would comment that this position Council's just stated is entirely new that we cannot present new documents that rebut the defense arguments. Throughout the document hearings where counsel for Q Sampan chose not to present documents, they presented new documents in their rebuttal, and we plan to do the same. Um, I would like the co-prosecutor can respond to us, telling us which new documents we presented in the rebuttals, because we specifically referred to the documents that the co-prosecution put forward in our rebuttals. So that is not true in the past. And in addition, the prosecution certainly did not inform us for today's hearing of any new documents it planned to present. I don't have those off the top of my head. Uh, and we were asked to, unlike the defense, which was given a day in between, we were asked, asked to present these documents the next day. So we've spent the morning and the evening preparing the documents. Uh, I don't know why council needs the documents, but uh, we will state them as we go along. Mr. President, the reason for which the uh, uh, co-prosecutor doesn't have at his fingertips the references of the uh, responses that we may have uh, used and as a rebuttal in other documents hearings is because there are none. We always use the documents as a point of departure that the co-prosecutor had brought up in our rebuttals. And concerning the difference of a day uh, for preparation, that we had for our responses at the time. There have been cases 
where there was a response the afternoon following the day that the court prosecution presented their key documents. And in any case, today, the court prosecutor is trying to uh, overcome what he had said that he didn't want to present new documents. He did it in a way that is not correct. So the principle is that we respond to the documents that were put forward in the key documents presentation of other parties. That's what we've always done. I don't know why the co-prosecutor would have a privilege today that we have not had it in earlier cases. C Council, would you agree that in your presentation you have gone beyond what is a normal document presentation to the role of the accused? You've basically started pleading and we have listened to it. Uh, and haven't interrupted you. You have gone into policies, you have a role of the accused would have been something much narrower and I think you yourself actually acknowledged that when in the beginning you warned us and said I would go far beyond what a, a more narrow reading of the role of the accused implies. Uh, so, so. I do not agree with you, Your Honor, Judge Vance, that I went beyond uh, what was in the segment. I simply recalled at the beginning of the hearing that during other segments when we wanted to present documents related to policy, it was the Chamber who said that it was during the segment on the rule of the accused that such documents should be presented. I simply followed the Chamber's instructions and specifically on the work sites at the time when one of my colleagues wanted to present something regarding policy, the chamber encouraged at the time it was the Kyosampan's team, but it, they encouraged all the parties to focus only on that particular segment and for general policies they should reserve those comments for the segment on the role of the accused in a global manner. So I, I didn't plead specifically. I took the number of minutes that I had to cite the documents and I, I spent it doing that and I know that it was extremely long for the people following that but I did it in the context of my presentation and I don't see why this would authorize the co-prosecutor to go beyond the practice of this chamber or to bring up new documents that have not been mentioned by other parties in advance. And I just want to note my objection. I would just clarify that none of these are new documents. They're all documents on the case file that have been referred to previously. But they are rebuttal.
President, the Chamber hands over the floor to Judge Lavenge to address the issues uh, raised by Kyosun Fon defense team. You may now proceed, Judge Lavenge. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. The Kyosampan team is objecting to the use of, by the co-prosecutor of documents other than those which were in the, their key documents presentation. However, if the Kyosampan team refers to a practice, I do not believe that the chamber has ever specifically excluded the possibility of using other documents than those which were presented in the initial key documents hearing in their response. So in that sense, uh, the, objectin, the objection is not well founded. In practice, indeed it is preferable for a party who intends to use documents to inform other parties in advance but to be truly equitable, the time limit to prepare for a presentation of responses to the key documents hearing yesterday was quite short. It was last night and this morning. So it would have been quite difficult for the court prosecutor to, to provide this list in advance. As not new documents, but different documents than those which were presented by the Kyosampan team, the Kyosampan team, if it wishes to, may present its own comments regarding the additional documents used by the co-prosecutor in their responses. If possible, and everything depends on what time the co-prosecutor will finish his responses, we would be prepared to hear those comments this afternoon. President, you may now resume uh, your response. Uh, international co prosecutor. National co prosecutor. Mr. President, I am now quoting document E3 slash 214 at Khmer EON 00 0530 English EON 00 4046 and French 00292933. This document is the statue of the CBK and I am quoting chapter 7, article 27. Chapter uh, 6, article 27, rather. All three categories of the Revolutionary Army of Cambodia, the Regular Army, Sector Army, and the Militias must be in every part under absolute leadership monopoly of the Communist Party of Cambodia. Mr. President, I have a short uh, proposal or request in relation to the reading of uh, that uh, document as stated by Judge Lavange. The presenting of uh, a new document, for the presentation of a new document, uh, at least parties could be prevent, uh, given at 24 hours to review that document first. And the co-prosecutors should have uh, informed parties of certain documents that uh, they wish to present today so that we can have uh, responses on the, those documents. Otherwise, it is difficult for us to respond to those documents presented. Some documents are very lengthy and consist of uh, many pages. So my request is that uh, the uh, Documents should be, uh, parties should be notified of the documents presented by the co-prosecutor co and also the exact page quoted. President, that is correct. This is the practice. Uh, identity number of the document uh, regard and also the page numbers uh, should be 
uh, informed through the parties and also should uh, inform the chamber. This is the uh, regular practice and this is a decision made by the chamber. The documents uh, used in this chamber should not consist of new documents and usually we allowed only the use of a document with the identification of E3 number. And the defense team for Mr. Kim Sung Pond will have uh, sufficient time to respond to the key documents presented by the co-prosecutors in a, an appropriate time, maybe this afternoon. At the end of uh, the session today, uh, you will have time to uh, make uh, your observation on those documents. We, the chamber, will allot proper time for you to respond to the key documents. You may now resume your response. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, Ben Kiernan was cited by the defense in his book, E3 1593. He also talks about a, a fact that we've heard many times in this trial, and that is that in 1975, the center created its own army, taking troops from the zones, which was not resisted by the zones. They gave up troops which shows again, demonstrates the power of the center over the zones. And in particular, uh, the quote from Kiernan is at page 94. In English, it's 01150044. In French, 00638829. And in Khmer, 00637499. Further showing the influence of the center over policy is the fact that the same policies we see carried out across Cambodia, across the DK, and that is the establishment of cooperatives, forcing people into cooperatives, forcing people to eat collectively, the abolishment of currency throughout the country, the abolishment of markets throughout the country, defrocking monks in all zones, in all areas of Cambodia, the prohibition of religious practices throughout the country, the arrangement of marriages, forced marriages around the country, the division of the population into new people versus base people, later modified into depositees, candidates, full rights, the use of biographies of the people, even sayings that we hear from one area of the country to the other, such as no gain in keeping, no loss in, in, in getting rid of them, pulling the grass and the roots. We see around the country the same practices that people disappeared when they were called to study sessions. And often we even see practices like playing music to muffle the sound of killings in areas widely separated around the country. To show the, while, while it's true that the zone and regional leaders, the district level had much authority, that authority was delegated to them by the central leadership. So in fact, the most serious power that a state could hold, or any individual could hold, the power to kill another person we know from the famous document E3-12, the 30 March 1976 decision of the Central Committee, where the Central Committee established that the right to smash inside and outside the ranks was delegated to the zone and for the central office to the central office committee, uh, independent sectors to the standing committee, and for the army to the general staff. Another theme of the defense argument was that the 
accused Q Sampan couldn't know about what was happening in the zones and the suffering of the people and the starvation of those in the countryside. But uh, Noradam Sihanouk uh, talks about his own travels with Q Sampan. And in one document, um, actually it was played in the closing uh, arguments, but it's uh, of case 2-1, in E3 slash 3113R, beginning at 2932. Sainuk says that at the beginning, from April 75 until, excuse me, from September 75 until April 76, I, as head of state, traveled through my country, through Cambodia, together with Q Sampan. I saw that the communes were concentration camps. I saw how work went on day and night. When the moon shone, people could not sleep. Sleep was not allowed. People had to work. I saw what people ate, for there was no rice. The rice was mixed with maize and other things, beans, even leaves, the chopped up sticks, stalks of banana plants. The diet was very, very bad. Philip Short talks about interviewing uh, the King Father, and this is at page in English 00396541, in French 00639894, about those trips. And what Sihanouk told Short is that my people had been transformed into cattle. Nyan Chanda also talks about Sihanouk talking about that trip. And this is at English 00, this is E3 slash 2376, Brother Enemy, at English 00192413, French 00237089, and Kamai 00191564. He talked about how Sihanouk tried to get out of the car, and he said that Sampan, next to the chauffeur, bolted out and told the prince to go back to the car. The defense for Q Sampan argued yesterday that the mistreatment of the new people was not a center policy. This was something that was done by rural people on their own initiative. But first of all, why were these new people sent into the countryside to share the meager rations that existed there with those that had lived there before? They didn't go there of their own choice. This was, again, a center policy. As Q. Sampan told the New York Times, this is E3 slash 687, a New York Times article published 9 July 1982. In English, the ERN is 0012 2280. In French, it's 0062 2450. And Khmer, it's 00651187. He said that millions of Cambodians had been sent out of Phnom Penh and into the countryside as a result of a collective decision. That's what the article, that the article says, Q. Sampan acknowledged that. And then it says, had he joined the decision, question mark. Mr. Q. Sampan chuckled dryly and replied in French, yes, evidently. In the revolutionary flag issue, E3 slash 742. It's the issue for April 1977. In English, the year end is 00478505. In French, 00499763. And in Khmer, 00062997. Point three, it indicates 
it is imperative to clearly distinguish the elements in the cooperative and to not allow any further confusion. And then it lists the three elements, full rights members, candidate members, depositees. Hugh Sampan attempted to explain this policy in his book on considerations, that's E3 slash 16, considerations of Cambodia's recent history. On the page that in Khmer, it's 00380469, in English, 00498286, and in French, 00643892. Q. Sampan writes, this was the principle of vigilance to prevent enemy agents of some countries from being able to bore holes from within the Kampuchean Revolutionary State Authority. So then it was imperative to grasp the history of each person, to make it easy for cadres and peasants to grasp the story of each person. The easiest thing was to differentiate them into old and new people. Why, why, Mr. Q. Sampan, was it necessary if people were to be treated equally, why did the center mandate that there be distinctions between the people, between base people and new people? Why did the revolutionary flag, the top leadership, instruct later that the cooperatives be divided into full rights, candidate members, and depositee members of the cooperatives? They created second-class citizenship for all of the new people. In their uh, presentation yesterday, council relied upon an article by Raoul Burgler, I believe his name is, the book called Eyes of the Pineapple. Since the defense has often, both Q. Sampan and especially Nun Chea, relied upon this, I would just like to point out that the book doesn't indicate any particular qualifications of the author, any original research. Apparently this was a dissertation, and if you look at his biography at the end of the book, it indicates he'd been a photojournalist for many years. But Burglar does say many things that contradict Q. Sampan and clearly show the responsibility of the center. He says on page, it's in English only, 001, this is E3 slash 7333, 00100 Burglar writes, the center, or at least the Pol Pot group, insisted that its policies were correct, although it gradually realized something was wrong. It did not want to recognize the problem to be its insistence to implement a practically impossible policy. Instead, it blamed the failures on the people who were supposed to execute it. These cadre criticizing the center's line, suggesting improvements or changes, were traitors. So the center ensured that the policies, the failed policies, would continue, partly by refusing to allow any dissent or any questioning of why these policies were failing. Council also spent a lot of time yesterday talking about rice exports and pointing out that all countries want to export goods. It's good for an economy. It's normal. We certainly don't question that. What we do question is when people, when your own people are starving, why do you export rice? What is more important than food to allow people to live? The Central leadership certainly knew about the exports and they even bragged about it. In the revolutionary flag of November 76, E3 slash 139. It said at Kamai 00064966, in English 00455284, and in French 004. 91920. We must export hundreds of thousands of rice, excuse me, hundreds of thousands of tons of rice 
during 1976. Our being able to export rights like this after a war casts a tremendous influence in the international world. Hu Sampan himself, in a speech he gave 15 April 1977. This is a document I believe was referred to yesterday, E3-201. In English, it's at 00419513. In French, 0061266. And in Khmer, 00292805. Kusumpan said, this is a great lesson, a great experience. In 1976, we managed to solve our problems and fulfill the production plan. As a result, we have a good crop for 1977. Now we can feed our people a sufficient ration allocated by the state. We even have a surplus of grain for export. Nun Chea also bragged about the exports. 16 January 1977 in a speech he gave to the Army. This is E3-191. The ERNs in English are S, quadruple zero, four zero seven six, and Kamai, 00649947, and in French, 00623123. The number two of the party said, our people have enough to eat. We have reserved two bushels of patty for each person in 1977. At the same time, we have a surplus of more than 150,000 tons of rice for export. This means we have fulfilled our 1976 plan. Kiernan, in his book at uh, French ERN 00639, this is E3 slash 1593, French 00639160, English 0115-0196, and Kamai 00637932. He talked about many refugees and survivors in Cambodia report that rice was being shipped to China despite the widespread spread starvation. He said in 1978, DK officials claimed to have exported 100,000 tons of rice the previous year to rice deficit countries such as Yugoslavia, Madagascar and Hong Kong. Another document that is a favorite of the Nunchea defense is Ram Lemkin's interview purportedly with Tuat Tuan. This is E3 slash 10665. But what Tuat Tuan, who was the adopted son of Ru Nim, he talked, said that at um, ERN, there is, it's not in French, but the ERN in Khmer is 0116847.5, and in English, 0115.6820. He said that Ross Nim groaned, and he said, this amount given to Angkor as the plan, the people ate porridge. There was not even rice husk to eat, because they took the rice husk. There was nothing to mill. And Talk to him went on to say this was the plan of the center office. If we could not have enough rice for them, they said we betrayed. And Kiernan, in the same book I've been quoting before, at page 01150217, in French 00639207, and in Kamai 00637. 7991. He quotes a base person named Savi who said that the Southwest zone cadres had accused the Northwesterners of feeding us gruel when rice was plentiful, but they soon were giving us less than before. And contrary to the position that Q Sampan's team argued yesterday, the center was not uninformed about what was happening in the zones. 
and the zones didn't always hide what was happening. We have documents on the case file, such as E3-179, which is a telegram to the center by Office 560. We know that's the Northwest Zone. Stated the 29th of May, 1977. In part two, the people situation, so it's right under that in all languages. It said, people's living standard is a shortage in many regions. Now people in regions one, two, four, six, and seven are the most needy. Most people at support bases eat thin rice soup gruel, while those at front battles have in some regions two cans of rice per day. Another telegram sent by Ru Nim on 11 May 1978, just a month before he was arrested and sent to S21. And this is E3 slash 950, point number two. He says, in the zone, shortage occurred in regions one, four, and five, of which the most shortage hit was region five, then region one and region four. It was said that the entire four districts of region five faced shortage. And going down a bit, we found out that the rice given by, by Ankar would be running out by May 10, 1978. So, we had Ru Nim, even up to May 1978, informing the center of shortages in, in, in the uh, northwest zone and the lack of food. But we know that the center continued to export rice to other countries. Two other reports, briefly, from other parts of the country. E3-1060 is a report from Division 801 stated 29 March 1977. And at ERN English 00574313, in French 0529407, and in Khmer 00231374. The report identifies three villages where, quote, people had been starving since February 1977 in Cooperative 36, and also talks about shortages in Cooperative 35. E3 slash 918 is a telegram from Say to Committee 870, dated 10 January 1978. The second to last paragraph, he reports that in Praia Vihir sector, the majority of places, there is starvation. So here we see that the center was not uninformed. We know that leadership traveled to the zones, including Q Sampan and Nunshea. They would have seen even more than what the King Father Prince Sihanouk saw about the condition and starvation of the people. They controlled how rice was distributed. One of the documents council used yesterday was E3 slash 230. And in point number seven, we see the standing committee in a meeting where Q Sampan attended, shows Ham attended, decided on the distribution of rice to specific places, to Mut, in Mias Mut, Kokong, and Sector 25, demonstrating the sector, the uh, center's power over rice distribution. Another document I'd like to briefly comment on that the defense used yesterday was E3 slash 222. Another standing committee meeting, this one of 15 May 1976. The only item on that agenda was national defense matters. And I think it's very interesting that we see Hem Q Sampan attending that meeting, showing that he was involved even in matters of national defense. Now, towards the end of the presentation yesterday, the defense argued uh, that Q Sampan didn't know anything about S-21 during the DK regime. And it cites as evidence, they cited the statement of Ng Tari, where she also tried to claim she had no knowledge of arrests and of S-21, claimed it was all an invention of the Vietnamese. She says, though, that 
Xi and Q Sampan together watched reports about S-21 while they were in Havana in 1980, soon after the fall of the DK regime. But Q Sampan, in his book, E318, Cambodia's Recent History, he tells a different story about when he learned about it. He claims it wasn't until he saw Ricky Pan's movie, S21, The Killing Machine. That movie wasn't out in the 1980s. That was long, long after the trip to Havana. So we appreciate that the defense has shown through Ing Tariq that Q Sampan's lying. Again, we know about not knowing about S21 until he saw the Ritti Pan movie, because Ing Tariq talks about watching reports about S21 in Havana with Q Sampan. But of course, the idea that a person in the position of Q Sampan, the very inner circle, circle of Pol Pot, the trusted, trusted advisor of Pol Pot, the head of state, a member of the cabinet of the, of the commerce, a uh, frequent attendee at standing committee meetings, would be the only one in Cambodia who didn't know about arrests is simply incredible. One of the documents that the defense cited was an interview with Kovani, who apparently was a cadre in the social affairs department working with Ing Tari. Even in her statement, which is largely protective of Ing Tari, she talks about how she knew about arrests. In English, at 00442654, in French at 00614084, in Khmer at 00602364. She goes into some detail about the arrests of Khoi Thun and Chun, the vice chairman of the Commerce Office, what people said about why they were arrested. She talks on the uh, a few pages on the same page about the arrests of Hu Nim and says Hu Nim and large scale arrests of in intellectuals from internal base, base and abroad. She talked about those. How does Kovani know about the arrest of Hu Nim, one of the original three ghosts, former member of the parliament, a long time associate of Q Sampan? And Q Sampan doesn't know about the arrests of Hu Nim. She also talked about Pang being purged after Von Vet was purged. Again, these are people that, of course, Q Sampan knew. How could Kovani know about these arrests? And Q Sampan has no idea about these arrests. It simply indicates he's been dishonest with you and with the Cambodian people throughout in claiming he was completely ignorant during the period of democratic Kampuchea about the arrests and disappearances. Even, in the, even the regional arrests were often reported to the center. In E3 slash 232, it's standing committee minutes from 8 March 1976. And at English 00182628, Khmer 00017116, and in French 00323932. It records that at this meeting, leaders from the North Zone, Comrade Srang, Sector 103, Comrade Hang, and Sector 106, Comrade Sot, came to report to the party leaders in Phnom Penh, including Nun Chia and Kyu Sampan, and reported on matters such as arrests and the large number of people ill at work sites. Another interview of Q Sampan appears at E3 slash 608. In Khmer, the ERN is 0635229. In French, 00632566. In English, 00419841. The interviewer indicates that some, by some accounts, 800,000 Cambodians perished after the Civil War. The allegation is that comprised individuals suppressed by the Khmer Rouge 
for political reasons. And Q Sampan answered, those traitors who remained in Cambodia have been executed. That was an interview with Italian journalists. In E3628, another interview given a long time ago, I don't have the date in front of me, but I believe it was in the 1980s. In English at 00524517, in Khmer 00709544, and in French 00740914. Q. Pan was asked, how many people were eliminated when you made your revolution? There he said, all I can say is the number is not more than 10,000. So contrary to his more recent protestations that he knew nothing about arrests or killings, back then he tells a journalist, while he's representing the remnants of the Khmer Rouge, that only about 10,000 were killed by the regime. In his interview with Steve Hedder that Q. Sampan gave in the 1980s, E3 slash 203. In English, the ERN is 0042413. In French, 00434232. And in Khmer, 00385489. Q. Sampan indicates that the Viet Minh had established agents to serve their Indochina strategies. Since then, year by year, those agents had gained more and more important positions. Some of them were in charge of major zones, and they distorted our line. It was an attempt to attack us from the inside out. Nevertheless, we fought constantly against these attempts and defended them. Until 1977-1978, we managed to deal with these people completely and brought order back to the country. Who does that sound like? It sounds exactly like Nun Chea and Pol Pot and their explanations for the killing of so many high-level cadre. This is Q Sampan giving that line, showing that he was well informed of the Pol Pot line and the reasons for killing higher ups, uh, high-level cadre in the country. In fact, on the very next page of that interview, He's asked by Heder, in 1975, what percentage of them were in the senior ranks of the party, in the Central Committee or the Standing Committee? Heder saying, what, what percentage of these were the Vietnamese agents, as Q. Sampan was claiming they were? He answered, there were many. Less than half in the Central Committee, but nearly half in the Standing Committee. So Q. Sampan appears to know very, very well about the investigations by the security, by the Sandoval, by S-21, and the claims that supposedly justified all of these killings, that all of these people killed were CIA or UN agents. In E3-3169, Steve Hedder, article on uh, the role of Q. Sampan, I believe cited yesterday, I believe, by the defense. Perhaps not, but in footnote 50 of that article, Heder notes that of the 16 grunk and funk figures for, whom, for whom Q. Sampan had responsibility, nine were eventually executed. Nine of the 16 people that Q, that Q. Sampan had responsibility for in the funk and grunk governments were executed, yet he still claims to have no knowledge of executions or disappearances. <coughs> Philip Short, in the book cited by counsel E3-9, in English at 00396574, in Khmer at 011-52652, and in French at 00639-935, writes that confessions of treasons were needed for men like Ing Sari and Q Sampan to read out at closed party meetings, proving that Ankar had as many eyes as a pineapple. 
that nothing could escape its vigilance. So Short has Q. Sampan reading out these S-21 confessions. These killings in the center and in the zone, Q. Sampan played a critical role in those killings because he promoted and defended the policies. In his speech of 15 April 1977, the anniversary speech, E3-201, at English 00419517, in Khmer 00292813, and in French at 00612172, Q. Sampan said, we must uphold our spirit of revolutionary vigilance at all times against the enemies from all quarters, both at home and abroad. And in next year's speech, E3-562, the year ends are in English, S-00-10563, in Khmer, 00-249989, and in French, 00280379. Q. Sampan told the many cadres, each of which themselves had individual power back in their zones, in their districts, in their communes. All of us would like to solemnly pledge the following. Number five, to exterminate resolutely all agents of the expansionist annexationist Vietnamese aggressors from our units and from Cambodian territory forever. Six, to exterminate resolutely all CIA agents. Nine, to exterminate the enemies of all stripes. So, Your Honors, we believe that the documents and the evidence in the case shows not only Q. Sampan's knowledge of the killing campaign, but his active participation, facilitation, and instigation of that campaign. Thank you for your patience. Mr. President, um, une observation par Mr. President, just a specific comment about what happened today in this chamber. I think that no one, and particularly not the Kyo Sampan team, is fooled here. The Kyo prosecution has just uh, uh, cut up on uh, presenting documents that it wanted to in the guise of a rebuttal against the Kyo Sampan team's key document presentation. And the most flagrant example of this, uh, because I have at least three documents in mind, but the saying, uh, there were several saying that we presented these documents yesterday, but that's not true. We didn't. But having said that, we must say that we are not able to respond to the rebuttals of the co-prosecution today, uh, as you have asked, and I will say very briefly why. The interest in having before the party presents their documents to have those documents and ERNs in advance before the presentation of the documents is that we have the opportunity to familiarize ourselves with them and to see what was written before and after. So just these few minutes that have just passed since we've found out about these documents, we obviously don't have the opportunity to do that work. So to respond to the concern that, uh, of what Judge Laverne said earlier, it is impossible for us to make the observations, even if they'll only be brief, it's not possible for us to do that today. And this is because the comments were far from being uh, rebuttals of, over what we said today, but they were their own uh, presentations. So if the chamber maintains its position to allow the Kyo Sampan team uh, to rebut, because this would be a rebuttal, to the presentation of the prosecution's presentation, I would like to inform you that we are not able to do that today, and I would like to state that very clearly.
Excuse me, if I could respond. Um, I was a asked earlier if to cite any time the defense had used documents that were not part of the prosecution response, prosecution's presentation in their response. I did find one instance, and this is at 11 2018. On the 30th of April, 2015, Mr. Lysek notes that two of the documents that the defense are using were not on the prosecution list. The prosecution didn't present them, but he said he had no objection to the defense using those documents. I would also point out that I understand it's very hard to respond instantly. Uh, you know, originally we were set to do our response at 9 o'clock in the morning. We got the defense list only sometime after 5 o'clock, I believe it was 5.30 yesterday, uh, before they sent us a large list of the documents they wish to present. So um, we would not have had any opportunity. We certainly didn't have 24 hours. We would not have had any opportunity other than reading those after 5.30 and before 9 o'clock to, to have it do us any good. Further, if it would be of any assistance to the defense, I'd happily provide them with my outline, which has all the documents and quotes that I used. It may help them uh, whenever they wish to respond. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to make a brief observation that we cannot respond promptly now. First, the doc there are 21 documents presented by the co-prosecutors, and they are not in the, our list. Only five documents are in our list that we presented yesterday. It is therefore necessary for us to review all most all the documents presented by the co-prosecutors. Co-prosecutor made mention that Kilsom Pond traveled with the king, the late king, across the country. And uh, I want to know how many documents uh, pointed out about the trips of Kilsom Pond with the king um, to all parts of the country. Then how many trips that Kilsom Pond uh, were made? I would like to make, I would like to be informed uh, clearly about uh, that statement. Uh, the co-prosecutor should have uh, informed us clearly, indicated clearly. I believe the chamber has all the arguments to make a decision on when we will expect you to rebut. Uh, President, the Chamber wishes to hear from you when is the appropriate time that you are able to make observation or respond to the documents presented by the co-prosecutors. The co-prosecutors already uh, responded to the documents, key documents presented by the defense team for Mr. Kilsom Pond yesterday already. And as for the observations or the responses of Kilsom Pond defense team uh, on the documents presented by OCP today will be on, uh, you will have time on Tuesday next week after the hearing of uh, testimony of Winwood T. By that time, you will be able to, you will be allowed to respond. Uh, this, this is clear for, for you. You will be allotted with time on 10. So uh, is that is that appropriate for you to respond on 10? Monsieur le Président, c'est ce que nous avons compris. Mr. President, that is what we had understood, and we will use this time slot since you have accorded it to us. Just a question. 
perhaps in parallel. Do we have any additional clarification on the planning for next week? Because we know that we do have a witness on Monday, and uh, Tuesday morning. But there was another witness uh, possibly to appear. Do we have any more information on that so that we can organize ourselves during the remainder of the week? President, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, the Chamber is not able to respond to your question now. At this time, we are now awaiting the hearing of the testimony of uh, some witnesses are requested by uh, parties. There is a complicated uh, uh, procedure uh, applied in, uh, in that country, so we are now working to deal with uh, the procedure so that uh, we may be able to hear that a witness as requested by the party. We will issue a decision on this case uh, very soon. We will send an email to inform the party about this uh, matter. Correction interpreter. It is now time for the adjournment. The chamber will resume its hearing on Monday, 9 of January 2017 at 9 a.m. On Monday, 9 January 2017, the chamber is hearing T2 TCW 1042 in relation to the approaches uh, on the list of uh, prisoners at S21. Please be informed and please attend the hearing. Security personnel are instructed to bring Kyu Thampon and Nunchia back to the ECCC detention facility and have them returned into the courtroom on Monday 9 January 2017 before 9 a.m. The court is now adjourned.